Okay, guys, today we have Ned Levine from Ecole Normale Supérieure talking about bootstrapping bulk locality. We thank you, Ned, for accepting our invitation and please take it away. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, so it's a pleasure to be there in uh, virtually in, in Porto. Um, and yeah, very nice of you to, to invite me to, to speak. I'm, uh, I've got some headphones. Uh, the audio is a bit strange for me. So uh, if I'm speaking weirdly, uh, yeah. That's why. Um, so uh, yeah, feel free to interrupt uh, any time. I, I have actually very few slides. Like I have like 20 something slides. So, um, you know, interruptions are very welcome. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm gonna talk about this, this project um, with Miguel. Um, so we actually forecast a series of papers about uh, bulk locality. Um, and uh, yeah, the first one came out a couple of weeks ago. Um, so I want to start with a sort of slightly distant motivation um, from the bootstrap, um, which sort of reflects a bit my, my origin and kind of uh, my, my PhD thesis was kind of uh, was in integrability. So I have some I'm kind of coming from an integrability uh, direction. Um, so are there integrable models on ADS2? Mm -hmm. You know, we, we know we have some. Oh, oh sorry. Matt, give us a, a second. I sure. did something that I shouldn't do. Uh, can you say something to see if it's working? Yep. Hello, hello. Well, testing, testing. Mm -hmm. Some audio problem. Sorry, nice. I, I think it's. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. No, 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 it's working. Sorry for yeah. for yeah. it. And please continue. Yeah, I, I just take carry on. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So uh, you know, we we know we have some nice um, quantum field theories in two dimensions. Something special can happen. You know, you can have. Have an integrable theory where, where certain aspects of the theory may be exactly solvable. Um, but you know, basically, this this only we only get this so far in, in flat space. I mean, we have this nice picture with some some kind of hidden symmetry, some some big tower, a hierarchy of integrable charges, and uh, and a, a special um, integrable F matrix, which has some very nice properties. Um, but um, you know, you could ask. Can you have some kind of uh, solvable quantum field theories on ADS2? Um, and of course, you know, we quite like quantum field theory on ADS2 because um, this, uh, this kind of theory is amenable to CFG techniques, right? Because we know that, uh, that the boundary correlation functions are satisfy the axioms of a conformal theory in, uh, in one dimension. So, so uh, conformal field theory, but just without stress tensor. So we know examples um, uh, which look like sort of they sort of smell like integrable uh, QFTs on ADS too. So one example is related to this um, supersymmetric Wilton line in N equals four super young mills. So here the black the black cylinder is ADS five. The boundary is is four um, D flat space um, with N equals four on it. And now if you put some say uh, straight straight Wilson line. Um, in the flat space, um, then you get some kind of defect CFT1 living on the Wilson line. And in fact, in, in the string picture, um, you get a sort of a dual effective uh, quantum field theory on ADS2, which is essentially, ADS2 is the, the minimal area string configuration whose boundary is this, um, is this uh, Wilson line in N equals four. Um, and, and the 
and, and the QFT in here is some kind of um, some kind of uh, uh, some kind of oscillations of, of this minimal area string. Uh, so you know this has been quite well studied, and it seems clear that like many aspects of this this Wilson line theory, this CFT one, uh, are integrable. They can be solved using integrability techniques, basically related to the ones um, that are used in equals four. So that's one example. It's maybe a slightly funny example because, um, well, for example, the um, it's kind of questionable how local the um, the the ADS two theory is in that case. It's essentially a sort of square root type theory, Oops. the square root type theory with some you know, some some interactions inside the square root. So it's sort of looks a bit like a somewhat non-local theory. So that's maybe a slightly funny example. Another class of examples which are, which are also a bit, well, they're, they're a bit trivial, is boundary conformal field theory. Because of course, a, a conformal field theory placed on ADS2, uh, it doesn't know that it's on ADS2, right? I mean, uh, there's a sort of equivalent of, of space-time under vial transformation. So you can just map uh, conformal field theory on ADS2 um, to, to a, a boundary CFT, right? So just a CFT on, on a flat half space with a boundary. And of course, we know some, some CFT2s which are integrable. You know, they're kind of exactly solvable, say minimal models, this kind of thing. Um, so there we get some kind of um, some kind of endpoint, right? These these boundary conformal field theories are like some uh, some kind of anchors in this, this space of quantum field theory. So then you could ask, you know, can I turn on some flow? If I start with some completely solvable uh, CFT2. Uh, in, in ADS, can I turn on some flow while preserving integrability? So, for example, um, you know, can I have an integrable sine Gordon theory on ADS two? And of course, uh, people in in this this research group uh, have discussed this very um, this very um, question in this interesting paper. And in fact, uh, it's it's really nice that I get to, uh, to talk with you because uh, uh, one one thing is that it would be very nice if if I could understand better. Um, um, you know, this, this topic, um, maybe you can, can explain to me a bit, but as far as I understand, it's, it's not ruled out that there may be some, some solvable, uh, some solvable sign Gordon type theory in ADS2. Um, but yeah, that's perhaps a, a subtle issue. But so one question would be, if there are integrable theories on ADS2, then what's the signature of their integrability? So in flat space, you know that you'll have some, some factorized scattering, no particle production. So, so in integrable scattering in flat 2D space, the particle number is conserved. And so what would be the analog of that for boundary correlation functions in ADS, which are of course the kind of closest analog of, of the F matrix uh, in ADS space. And um, so, so, you know, one guide, I guess, would be to, to think about starting with some QFT and ADS, with some boundary correlators, and asking that in the flat space limit, what you get, what you land on, will be, um, will be an integrable S matrix. So down here, you know, we, we know what we should look for. Um, and, and in fact, this, this, um, this property was studied, for example, in, in this recent paper. So there they found some sort of sufficient condition um, for four point scattering, or, or I should say four, four point boundary correlators in ADS2. So you can think of these as the CFT1 is living on the boundary of ADS2. Um, in order to land on flat space S matrices, which, um, which only exchange uh, two particle states. So if you draw a cut yeah, in the middle here, you'll, you'll just pick up two particle states. Um, so that's one kind of uh, encouraging fact. So you can you can you can kind of see in ADS what uh, what kind of spectrum you need to have in order that when you take the the, the flat space limit, the S matrix you get uh, looks like an integrable one. So so what specifically what they what they found um, in that paper is is that um, they should take sort of just one tower of state. So like, uh, these are just double traces uh, plus some anomalous dimension. 
And you see that in a free theory, if you just fused some phi fields, so if you had a free theory on ADS2 and a generalized free theory on the boundary, then when you fuse two phi fields, you would just get a double trace. You would just get these states two delta phi plus two n. But if you add generic interactions, you'd of course introduce um, sort of loads and loads of towers of other states, higher trace states that would appear in this fusion. So, so the idea is to try and carefully introduce interactions in a way that, that doesn't introduce extra towers of state. So one proposal would be that that, that would be um, a way to build integrable theories like on ADS2. So it's, it's nice that you know in ADS we have this, uh, this discrete spectrum and we have this OPE language on the boundary. Um, so in a kind of bootstrappy picture, um, you may think that this, this kind of minimal spectrum so, so a spectrum where the number of states is, or the density of states is the same as a free theory, it, it's related to being uh, on the boundary of the allowed region. So, so uh, some solution which saturates uh, some, some unitarity bound. And indeed, we, it's natural that that should be linked with integrability, right? Because we know that when you saturate unitarity, um, there's this extreme functional story um, and I mean, I guess it's not at the level of a theorem, but but in general, you expect that, that if you saturate unitarity, then um, then consistency conditions alone may fix uh, the coefficient, uh, the, the data. So, say for example, in crossing the the, the OPV coefficient. So, so there's some kind of link between being able to solve the theory and being uh, being on this boundary. So, indeed, for example, in the S matrix bootstrap, we know that being being at some special point. It's sort of correlated with being, uh, you know, we we find special integrable solutions at these at these special uh, points. So, so that was all sort of um, very high in the sky um, motivation. But now let me get a bit more concrete and talk about our setup. And um, so we consider a quantum field theory placed on ADS in the arbitrary dimension, and in particular, this QFT is local. Right. And um, and so you know that this is one way to engineer conformal theories in, in D dimensions. Because as you, push, um, as you push local bulk fields towards the boundary, and thanks to, uh, thanks to these, this sort of pioneering work, we know you can argue in general that, um, that these bulk fields will be expandable in the in the boundary Hilbert space. So essentially, um, one way you can argue is by uh, looking at this ADS in global coordinates and and seeing that when you pick some Poincaré patch, so that's like radial quantization around some particular point in the boundary, the Hamiltonian uh, is mapped to dilatation around that point, and constant time slices are mapped to uh, hemispheres, uh, geodesic hemispheres. Um, and so basically, all you have to do to argue that, uh, that a bulk field can be expanded as a sum of boundary primary is, um, is just to say that general states are sums of uh, energy eigenstates, and energy eigenstates are related to dilatation eigenstates, which, which must be uh, local operators, um, with, which are either primaries or um, and so that's how you argue. So you get a sum over primaries. These these operators C are just fixed by by isometries, and they just like, account for the effects of descendants. Um, and see, the only real dynamics is in these these BOE coefficients. The different choices of these coefficients mu will specify different operators psi in the in the bulk, different fields. Does that make sense? So you, so you always have, for any quantum field theory in ADS, you always have a boundary operator expansion. The theory doesn't need to be conformal in ADS. And that means that, that you get this conformal theory on the boundary, which consists of some operators with some scaling dimensions and, um, and some, some structure constants. And so they'll satisfy crossing and unitarity 
uh, and they'll, but they'll also satisfy some other property, right? So, so they won't just be a generic solution of crossing in unitarity, but actually the ones you get from ADS will be some very special theories. So they'll actually have some extra property, which encodes the fact that the, the, the bulk theory you started with is local, right? So if you started with some random CFT or conformal theory without stress tensor, you wouldn't be able to fill in the local bulk. Right? It's some very special um, constraints on these BOE coefficients, um, which actually allow uh, a bulk to be, to be reconstructed. So we, in, this, in this talk, I want to explain how to characterize uh, this, these bulk locality constraints. So that's really the aim of this work. So, so what, what does it mean that, that this conformal field theory comes from the bulk, comes from a local bulk? And the particular setup we'll focus on will be a, of so-called ADS form factors. So that just means a mixed uh, correlation function uh, with, and, and we'll take it specifically to have one bulk insertion and two boundary insertions. So this thing can be expanded in blocks just by using the BOE. Oh, sorry. This is a, this is a typo. It should not be there. Um, so, so you can just expand using the BOE, this bulk field as a sum of boundary primary. I just write it schem schematically like this. And so I get these, these coefficients mu appearing. Right? And then I basically get a sum of three point functions. Um, right, because I then have one, two, three boundary operators. So that's where I get these lambdas coming from. And yeah, so I, I've already stripped off some, some kinematic factors, which are just bulk to boundary propagators. But, uh, but so those aren't important. And what we're left with is just a function f of one cross ratio. Sure, it's not too important to see how it looks, but it looks like this. And um, so, you, so as I said, you get this combination mu times lambda appearing. The lambda delta one two just means the structure constant related to this three-point function of, of O delta, O one, and O two. We just put O one, put one and two upstairs just for easy notation. And um, and so these blocks that we get here are some particular functions of this uh, this cross ratio. Um, and they they sort of look a bit like one D conformal blocks. Um, if you put some particular values of these parameters, then they'll just become one D conformal blocks. Uh, but, but actually, you know, in general, we are in any dimension here. So, um, so this, this all applies for any dimension. <clears throat> what, what is this U that, that you write in the cross ratio? Ah, oh, yeah, sorry. So here, yeah, just so I have some coordinates X on the boundary and U is the radial coordinate. And okay. you can always assume for the purpose of this talk that I'm, I'm using the, this Poincaré metric. Um, Mm -hmm. yeah. So U is just the radial coordinate. And so, so we're going to focus on this particular um, object, this mixed three-point function, um, because it's basically the simplest object that manifests some non-trivial constraint from locality. So what does locality say about this object? So essentially it says that this guy should only have a cut on the negative real axis. So this, this f of z should be an analytic function of this cross ratio z. And you can really prove this actually um, from, from, the, from the BOE. Um, so f should really be analytic and it should only, have, uh, should only have one cut on the negative axis. And in particular, there should not be any cut here. So this is where you see locality. And the reason this is non-trivial is Yeah, sorry. Hi, hi. Yeah, you can continue, sorry for, about this. No worries. So the reason why it's non-trivial to get no cut on the positive axis is that in fact, at the positive axis, this BOE begins to break down. So it just so happens that this, this positive real axis um, is precisely the place where the BOE fails to converge. And each of these blocks appearing in the sum gets a discontinuity. So the objects in the sum even become uh, ill-defined. So, so somehow uh, you have to make sense of this fact that 
that f is a sum of, with some coefficient of objects which have an extra cup. And so the, the problem you have to, to solve it is choosing these coefficients carefully so that you can resum all of these spurious cuts uh, and make them cancel out. And so although it seems a bit funny that we, we talk about this BOE, even though it doesn't converge precisely at the place we care about, this, this positive real axis, as, as we can argue later, in fact, it, it does converge in a sort of distributional sense. Uh, so, so it still makes sense to, to talk about it as long as you smear this BOE against some appropriate um, kernel. So this is the locality bootstrap problem, and we should give credit to these, these authors uh, who, who kind of, um, who, who took note of this problem years ago. Um, you know, so choosing these coefficients uh, so that the upper cuts of these, these two F1, these, these blocks uh, cancel out in the sum. Um, and so just to highlight a few fe features of this problem, if you compare it to crossing, you see that it's non-positive. So the, these coefficients here, mu lambda, are, are not positive. They're not something squared. Um, and in fact, they're, they're typically alternating. Um, so, so, you know, you might think it's a bit like in spirit, a bit like crossing for non-unitary theories or something like that. Um, but, you know, despite this non-positivity, we, we find that we still can get quite a lot of mileage. Um, and one special case of this setup will, of course, be boundary conformal field theory. As I mentioned earlier, um, in the special case where this would be a, a CFT, uh, you know, that, that's a particular solution of, of this problem. Um, so, you know, you can just put a CFT on, on, on ADS, and that would be equivalent to a, a CFT on a, on a flat half space. So one particular class of solutions will be boundary conformal field theory. And just to state the result, uh, before I go into like technical details, uh, is we, the result is that we construct a complete set of some rules which characterize this false locality. Um, so, so we find these guys, um, th these, these functionals, um, which, which give you some list of some rules, uh, n equals one, two, on these coefficients. Um, so, so any questions just before I go into the details? Uh, what is theta? The theta is some um, something which we're going to construct, which is basically if you know, sort of fixed by kinematics. I mean, we're going to build this. This is our our functional sum rule. So, so this is the task for the rest of the talk to build theta. Mm -hmm. So, so you so the claim is that bulk locality is equivalent to, to this thing. At least bulk locality in, in the sense of like the relation to one particular bulk field. I mean, probably if you want, you know, this is like looking at one correlator. Okay. Any other? Is it making sense? Because I can't really see very many of you. I'm, I'm just uh, uh, unsure if I'm if I'm losing everybody or if it, are you all, are you with me broadly? I think it's okay. Yeah, I think yeah. we are all with you. Great. Yeah. Great. Uh, okay. So the plan is first, I want to explain when, how to derive these sum rules. Then I'll talk about some applications, and finally, um, I'll discuss the flat space limit when these form factors become. Uh, become flat space form factors. So first, let's start with the sum rule. So the problem is to, um, to, to characterize the vanishing of a certain branch cut, right? So it's kind of a simple problem. You've got this F, you take a certain discontinuity of it, uh, you know, a certain region of it is discontinuity, and you ask that this function is zero. So it's really just a certain function being zero. So that's kind of a simple, there's a simple way to characterize that. So you, just, you define some functional theta whose action on F is just to smear its imaginary part, its discontinuity in that region against a bunch of kernels, Fn. Right? So, so that's kind of a simple idea. You, you want the function to be zero, you just project it against a bunch of, a bunch of different uh, kernels. And so somehow you should, you should pick these Fn to be some complete set of functions in some appropriate sense. 
So, so that's what we're going to do. And um, the way that this yields some rules is essentially through the BOE. So here I've got the BOE. Um, so I can, I can expand F as a sum of blocks. And I just plug that into the integral. And um, so essentially, uh, that, that will just, then this second line will just become equivalent to this list of some rules, right? So n equals one, two. Um, where these, these numbers, theta n of the delta, are just defined by this functional theta n acting on the delta block. And so here, you crucially need to use um, a property which we call swapping, which allows the exchange of order of the integration and, uh, and the summation over delta, right? So if you, plug, if you plug the BOE in here, you're going to have an integral of a sum. And here, what we want to end up with is a sum of an integral. So this swapping property has to be carefully derived, and I'll explain in a few slides time how to prove it. So, so, so this will give you a list of sum rules uh, for any complete, a complete list of sum rules for any complete uh, set of functions. And we're going to now um, derive a particular uh, set of functions, set of uh, functional kernels, which have nice properties. So. The way I'll derive them is a bit roundabout, but um, so, so just bear with me. Um, so we're going to define some objects called local blocks, which are sort of analogous in the crossing equation case to Polyakov blocks for the, uh, for the experts. So we need an assumption that for large Z, uh, so it's like some kind of regge limit, um, the, the form factor, this, this, this three-point function has some kind of um, polynomial bounded behavior. So it shouldn't be like exponential or something. But you know, this, this, the exponent can be, uh, sorry, the, the, the power can be anything. And you know, we actually know that it really depends on S. So like you, you can have, you can build different, um, different correlators that have uh, different, uh, different uh, powers of Z. And you can go as high as you want. So it's not like, you know, it, you really have to let this thing be arbitrary. And in fact, a recent paper um, gave um, a sort of, um, gave an argument in, in a particular context, which, which we think can be generalized to say that, that a polynomial bound of this type will basically always be derivable um, under a certain assumption on the UV of the, of the theory in ADS. So if you assume that in the UV, um, there's a CFT on ADS. Then this alpha will be related to uh, to the the highest uh, scaling dimension operator that appears in the UV uh, in the UV expansion of the the bulk field. So this is a sort of natural assumption, basically, is what I want to say. So let's write down a dispersion relation for S. We can always write express the value of S at some point as a contour integral around that point. And we put f of z divided by z minus w. And now, because we want to be able to deform the contour um, without picking up a polar infinity, we can add some function here, which should basically have value 1 at z equals w. But we choose it so it has the property that it, it, kill, it will kill the large uh, w behavior. So as long as we pick alpha large enough, alpha tilde large enough, so larger than alpha f minus one, then we can wrap the contour around infinity and we don't pick up any, any contribution. And so then the contour just goes around um, the only other singularity. So it now wraps the negative cut. And here we crucially use locality, right? So we're assuming this locality property that there's no branch cut here. So under the assumption of locality, you can make this, this, uh, this uh, contour move, and you end up with some integral of some discontinuity along the, the negative cut, and with some multiplied by some kernel. 
And uh, so this is our, our dispersion relation. But now basically um, something nice happens if we plug in the BOE. So I just put the BOE to the, into the left-hand side. I just get a sum of blocks. And now if I, if I plug the BOE in to F on the right-hand side, and I pull the sum through the integral, so I'll get a sum here over delta, which I pull through the integral, and I'll end up with the sum with these coefficients multiplying some object, which I define to be this same transform, the, this integral over the negative axis, applied to the individual block. All right, so this is the definition of this, this local block L. Um, and you see that L depends not just on delta, but also on, um, on, on this parameter alpha tilde that we, we put into our, our kernel. So now I get, and so here again, I'm using this swapping property, which is, is basically the same as the swapping property I, I mentioned before. So I'm, the property, this allows me to exchange the order of this integration and, and summation. Um, and I should just mention, by the way, that there are extra one, two labels, which I'm suppressing everywhere, um, just for easy notation. One, two. Um, and so, so this is nice because what we started with, so on the left-hand side, we have some, this BOE, which makes manifest uh, conformal invariant. So it's kind of manifest the isometries of ADF. Whereas on the right-hand side, we have something which doesn't make manifest conformal invariant, but it manifests locality. And why is that? So that's actually because each of these local blocks is local. So each of these guys, in, due to the way it's been constructed, it doesn't have a cut on the positive Z, the positive real Z axis. And that's essentially because um, it's essentially because, well, maybe it's easier to see from this from this equation. Somehow L is like a it's a version of G that that only has the negative cut, right? You see that if if you just look where is the discontinuity here, uh, you'll see that it it only comes so in the Z variable. It only comes from from this power. So it would just be on the negative axis. And, and so there is some, there's some pairing between these local blocks and the regular blocks. You know, in the, in the small Z asymptotic, these local blocks are, um, they, they go like, um, like the, the blocks up to some kind of fixed, uh, fixed power of Z. Um, so, so the statement is then that I can I just erase all my, my stupid annotations. The statement is that locality is equivalent to having two expansions. So that this BOE expansion has another expansion with the same coefficient, but with manifestly local objects. And so, you know, here we, we basically showed that locality implies this, this expansion as a sum of local blocks. But in fact, it goes the other way around as well. So you can show that, that, that um, this, this equation is equivalent to locality. And now we can move the contour back. And so, if you just stare at the form of this uh, of this kernel, you'll see that the the it picks up a pole at w equals z, which gives it gives this g delta, and then we also pick up a discontinuity now on the on the positive axis because each of the blocks does have a discontinuity there, right? So we get two terms, and so this is another way to see that these l's are local. It's like the second term here is sort of subtracting off the upper discontinuity of the first term. So now we can actually derive from this local block expansion the same sum rules I mentioned before. 
So this, this second term here on the right-hand side is some function of Z. So in particular, we can expand it as a sum of blocks. And that just follows basically because these blocks are some complete Z function. And so there, there'll be some coefficient in this expansion, which we call theta. And it turns out that for this, for this kernel, you can check that the only blocks that appear are some, so this should be a tilde, are some double traces, starting from n equals one. So they have dimension two alpha tilde plus two n. And um, now, the condition that the that the uh, the block expansion is equivalent to the local block expansion. If you just subtract the right hand side from the left hand side, it just becomes this list of some rule. I apologize. This should be mu lambda. Kind of an old, an old notation. So, you know, if I, if I just subtract these. Uh, and now expand this thing in these blocks, and I just get this list of something. Is that clear? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So, so you can get so just from this dispersion relation, you get this local block expansion, which is analogous to Polyakov uh, block expansion in, in the crossing case. And this yields, this, this, the equivalent of these two expansions yields a list of sum rules. These sum rules are, they are the integrals against some functional kernels, basically because this kernel can also be expanded in blocks. And um, so here we, here we get some, some functionals of exactly the type that I, I mentioned before. But there are a couple of subtleties that I skipped over. So one is completeness. You know, we want to say that the functional kernels that define these, these sum rules are some complete set of functions. And it, indeed it's true. So you can check that these, these functionals that, um, that I derived from the local block expansion, they correspond to integration against some particular kernel, which are some power of Z times polynomials in one over Z. Um, and essentially, these polynomials are some complete set of polynomials, purely in the sense that they, that Pn is order n, is degree n polynomial. So you have one polynomial of each order, and this this basically is enough for completeness. Uh, essentially, that follows from the fact that if some function is orthogonal, okay, I'll do on zero one. Some function is orthogonal to all polynomials, n equals zero, one, two. That implies the function is zero. So that's true for h being a function or even a distribution, just a, a fact. So that allows you to say that these functionals, these functional sum rules, fully characterize locality. It's not just that they're necessary conditions for locality, but they're also sufficient. So we have completeness. And this swapping property that I mentioned a couple of times, uh, I'm not gonna explain in detail, but essentially you can just prove it using dominated convergence. And you need to use this polynomial boundedness of S as well as, um, sorry, this is a typo, as well as some properties of these functionals. So these S are analytic in a certain domain and bounded, um, and bounded at infinity with a certain power. And so you see that, so, so this allows you essentially to prove swapping. And now I can, I can be a bit concrete about what I said earlier in saying that the BOE is well-defined even though it stops converging at this, at this positive region. So it stops converging here. But the reason why, why it's okay to use it is just that, um, with this integral, we can essentially um, lift the contour slightly away from the axis. So we can go into the region where the BOE does converge. And that's allowed basically because everything is analytic. So, so the, the functionals are analytic. 
particular. And and the yeah, I, I mean, so, so you can even you can even think of in, think defining the functionals on a contour like this. Right. So if I call this gamma, I can define I can define the the theta n functional as the integral along gamma of f n. And I know that when I wrap it around, and I wrap it back to, to wrap around the positive axis, this functional is characterizing the vanishing of this discontinuity. So I said that we like these, these particular functionals which come from the local block expansion because they have some nice properties. And so the main sort of nice property, other than that these, this analyticity and boundedness, is that their zeros are in nice places. So, these theta m of alphas, uh, so I'm getting some notification. Someone's phone seeing me, it's coming through to my headphones. Apologies. So these, these theta m of alphas have zeros at the double traces. Two alpha tilde plus two n. So in some sense, they're they're dual to this this GFF like spectrum. And so, so you see that they have each theta, the nth theta, has a a one at one of the at the nth value, the, the nth point in this spectrum. And so this basically means that these functionals. These theta functionals, their purpose in life is to bootstrap the solution of this problem corresponding to free theory in ADS. So specifically, if I put a free scalar field in ADS in any dimension, you shouldn't put phi in the bulk, like here, because it's a free field. So you, what you get is just like two trivial. So things which satisfy free wave equations. They, they, can only they can only contain two blocks in this expansion, so it's really quite trivial. So let's put phi squared, which is a bit more non-trivial. And we'll put phi and phi as our boundary field. And so you can check that what you'll get will be a sum of double trace blocks, two alpha tilde plus two n, with some coefficients. And now what I'm saying is that these theta functionals, their purpose is to, like, the thing that they do best is to, uh, to bootstrap these coefficients. If you apply the, the m functional to, to this equation, then you see that you get, you know you get zero, right? Because the functional, functional the sum rule is, is zero equal. And now there are only two terms that are non-trivial from this sum. There's the nth, so the m term, which is cm, times one, because the, the mth functional is equals one on the mth block. And then we get the zeroth term. Because these, these functionals somehow miss, miss the zeroth term in this one. And so that means that the ratio cm over c0 is completely fixed by the functional. So basically the CMs are completely fixed up to one ambiguity, which just corresponds to like rescaling this, this bulk field by some constant C. So you'll always have this kind of ambiguity. And so, so I want to emphasize that these, these functional theta, they give some rules for any solution of locality, right? So they fully characterize the locality constraints. So the sum rules, they look like this. Uh, sorry. But what happens if you assume a particular spectrum? So if I assume that the spectrum appearing in the BOE is, is this double trace spectrum, so like a free, a free spectrum, then this sum rule gets sort of diagonalized. So under a particular choice of the, of the BOE spectrum, these sum rules become very simple and they just really have one term appearing. So they completely fix 
the VO eco, the, the, this combination of coefficients of new lambda. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So, so they basically are perfectly adapted to find these coefficients um, in free theory. And they're, but they're valid for any solution and they apply non perturbatively and they're absolutely convergent. So there's some absolutely convergent sum rules for any solution. So that, but they're also really useful in perturbation theory. So if I add some perturbation to a free theory, then I get some, the sum rules become only sort of perturbatively complicated. So kind of order by order, you can actually harvest a lot of information in perturbation theory. So for example, one, one case that we looked at in the paper is where we put two species of free scalars in ADS with some, say, some different masses. And, um, and we look at this, uh, this particular form factor. Um, and so we, and here we, we add to a free theory of an interaction vertex like this. So the leading diagram is, is something like, like this one here. Um, and here there are now two towers of state. So I get an extra tower compared to the free solution. Right, I have these double traces with delta, delta being related to the mass of phi, and also the double traces with delta tilde, which is related to the mass of phi tilde. And so the functionals don't fix everything in this case, now that you add this perturbation, but they do fix one tower of coefficients in terms of the other. So if you start with one or the other, you can get the other tower. So they sort of give you half the information for free. So another thing we, we looked at is, you may think these local blocks, right, they're some, they're local, they're some kind of form factors, right? They're, they're some solutions of this problem. And they contain certain blocks, right? So remember from before, they equal the, the, the conformal block, or I shouldn't call it conformal block, the, mm -hmm. the boundary block, we actually call them, minus a bunch of terms like this. So these double traces. So you may think that you can actually find some ADS Wickham diagram that would that would engineer these local blocks for you, right? Because they're just some some solution of this problem um, with with these particular blocks. And indeed, that is the case. So basically, these local blocks just equal exchange diagram. So if I I put um, I put some theory of um, free fields by one by two and psi delta in ADS where delta is related to the dimension of psi. Uh, and I put a, a vertex, you know, where these things, these three all meet, this. Uh, then this exchange diagram just, just builds the local block for you, where this alpha tilde is related to these external dimensions. And so this is actually the way to easily compute the explicit form of the functional, the, the functional action theta of delta. So you just compute this diagram and you just read off by expanding this guy in blocks, uh, the form of these thetas. So in some particular normalization, they become very simple. It's just a gamma function and a linear piece. And then it's multiplied by some symmetrization factor. So the gamma function makes a whole tower of zeros and this linear piece cancels one of the zeros. So these functionals have simple zeros uh, with equal spacing, and they miss one of them. So there it equals one. So another application we considered is rather than thinking about um, thinking about these sum rules as a recipe for like bulk reconstruction, you can try and think of them as some constraint on the boundary CFT. Right, so like you can think like that they're characterizing um, which CFTs can admit a local bulk. 
And so how can we see um, those constraints in the CFT? So the idea is to fix the bulk field size and to vary the boundary operators. So that means get with a fixed size that the coefficients mu will be fixed. So they, they don't change. And now we change one and two. So, so these coefficients do change. And we'll focus on the GFF example, just because it's, I mean, it should apply really for any, any theory, but in the GFF case, we have like the best control over uh, through the functional. So as I wrote before, the sum rules tell you some equation like this. So they tell you that mu lambda of n divided by mu lambda of zero is fixed in terms of these functionals for any value, for any choices of external operators. But now we can eliminate mu by dividing this equation by itself with a different value of, of one and two. So here I, I call it one, two hat. That's some other value, some other choice of external operators. And that gives you some, some relations, some linear relations between OPE coefficients. In fact, it's an infinite set of relations. So you see the message is that it's very non-trivial to admit a local bulk, an NADS local bulk. You get some, you have some infinite list of constraints on the OPE coefficient. And so for example, you can use these constraints to just compute some OPE coefficient from, from other ones. So like we just picked some kind of random example, we computed these, these OPE coefficients in GFS series, which you know may not be so easy to compute by other methods. Um, so, so yeah, the message is, is just that uh, bulk locality places a lot of constraints on, on the boundary CFT. So uh, I see that the time is marching on. So I'll just briefly comment on the flat space limit and then wrap up. So the flat space limit for F matrices, so for boundary correlation functions, uh, has been quite well studied. Uh, for example, this is an important paper. And the recipe is kind of the same here. So we start with our ADS form factor and we ro rotate to Lorentz kinematics and then take a, a large radius limit where we, we want to land on a gap theory. So we take all the dimensions large. So these deltas go to infinity, the radius goes to infinity and the mass is, is kept fixed. And so the claim is that these ADS form factors just become flat space form factors. So like the, the overlap between a local, um, a local operator insertion and some on-shell state in the flat space limit. So here S is related to uh, one minus uh, Z over four, four here. Uh, something like that. So S is related to Z in some way, where S is the uh, usual Mandelstam invariant. So because we have two boundary operators, we get two on shell states. And so the claim is not that, um, that this limit should exist for all kinematics, all values of kinematics. But so the prescription is that um, you should take this limit in a kinematical region where it converges and then analytically continue. Of course, the risk is always that this analytic continuation may yield extra, extra singularities that weren't there before you took the flat space limit. Right. And so one important assumption, which we don't, um, we don't justify yet in our work is that, um, is that, you, that this locality condition in ADS, so the vanishing of this branch cup, that, that this translates without failing into the analogous condition for the form factor in the flat space limit. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is an important condition. This is like, I think this is sometimes called one of Watson's equations. Let's say the first Watson equation. So this is like an gem important general consistency condition for flat space form factors, that you shouldn't have any, any uh, negative S branch cut. So they just have a branch cut on the positive S axis. Um, and so, so this, we don't really have like a, a, um, 
a sort of detailed justification for, except just like a posteriori, like we checked in certain examples that, that it, it happens. And so um, we also computed a phase shift formula analogous to what was done for the, for the F matrix. So for the on-shell kinematics, so on the positive cut, we can write an expression for this um, flat space form factor as a sort of large delta average of this data, so these, these coefficients mu lambda. And they appear here uh, sort of uh, divided by the free value, so these GFS values. Um, so I won't say too much about this. But, so this phase shift formula was, was again derived according to a certain assumption. So we assume that um, we assume that the flat space limit and the um, on-shell kinematic limit commute, which again we, we don't have a justification for. But uh, but we do see something nice with this phase shift formula. So we see some, something analogous to, to what, what we've seen for the F matrix, that if you assume a certain BOE spectrum, so you assume that for large delta at least, so it's a large delta, the states are just double traces plus some anomalous dimension, then you get Watson's second equation, which is, which is a, sorry, I should also say this is in two dimensions, ADS, ADS2. Uh, so you, you find that the discontinuity of this expression is given quite precisely by the S matrix. So this is, this is a, a well-known fact for 2D integrable S matrix, or sorry, 2D integrable form factors. So we can derive this by assuming a certain uh, type of BOE spectrum, a sparse BOE spectrum. So that's quite nice and gives some hint, uh, some hint about, about integrability. But um, so let me say something more about integrability, which relates to the, the second part of this series. So here we saw that we have functionals which are dual to, uh, to the GFS solution. They kind of, they exactly bootstrap the GFS solution which is similar to, to what was found for the crossing equation in one dimension. But actually, this locality problem is sort of simpler than, uh, than, than the crossing equation. And in this case, we can actually generalize this, um, these, these functionals to interacting functionals, which exactly bootstrap arbitrary sparse spectra. So if you get some, if you just pick some random set of deltas, delta n star, which are, equal to, which become the double traces for large n. But they can be sort of arbitrarily, you could put like a million of them in one small space and then leave a long gap and land on the GFS type spectrum in the UV. So for any spectrum like that, we can find a set of functionals, complete set of functionals that has zeros in those places. So here I've just drawn an example where I see I've put two, two um, points in the spectrum near to each other. And, and we can get functionals which have, have zeros in those places. And so the dream would be that something similar could be done um, for, for the 1D crossing equation. And that would really be telling you, uh, giving some hint at that, perhaps some integrable theory in ADS2, right? because you'd have, um, you know, you have some, some special extremal solution to the 1D crossing equation that are, would be like these, these, um, these kind of, minimal deformation of the free theory. Um, since I'm out of time, I'll, I'll just skip uh, this slide. I just wanted to say that another, another thing we, we plan to do is to generalize to the context where the bulk has gauge and gravitational symmetry. So this would be, gravitational case would be like real, real holography, not just rigid holography. And so other things, um, to look at in the future. So this bulk locality condition, as I said, it, it can be seen as an extra constraint on the CFT. Right? You can try and kind of eliminate the, the bulk, you eliminate the mu's and see what it imposes on the CFT. And in the flat space limit, that should be telling you like there would be some extra constraint on an S matrix, which you could impose 
in order that it admits local form factors, right? So there would be like some strong locality constraint for an S matrix to admit local form factors, which may be a useful uh, extra condition that could be imposed in say S matrix bootstrap studies. So for example, this kind of extra locality constraint wouldn't be obeyed by the string S matrix, which presumably does not admit local form factors. And so other questions like, can you combine uh, this locality bootstrap with crossing in some semi-definite way that's amenable to SDDT and sort of efficient numerical solutions. Um, one particular context that seems quite simple is like boundary conformal field theory. And uh, yeah, another thing which would be very interesting to study would be like higher point functions. Suppose you put one bolt in the three boundary insertions, and then you would actually have more than one expansion channel. So you'd get some, some extra crossing equations. So I'll stop there and thank you. Yeah, that's right. Thank you very much. Uh, questions here? Okay, I have a question. For you, it's really important, and that's your goal, okay? Uh, but for you, it's really important that you assume that you have some local operator on the bulk, mm. right? for you to use BOE. Let's now assume that this notion doesn't, doesn't exist. I think this is more related with your part three, right? Mm -hmm. You cannot actually really define a, a local operator. What can you do? Is there, is there any notion of BOE where you, you lose some locality or there's no such thing? Yeah, so the idea would be that, say in uh, gauge theory, where you, if you put a charged operator in the bolt, or in mm -hmm. gravity, you know, anything should be charged. Then this thing is not local because it should be dressed with some flux or yeah. a Wilson line or something. And so this this dressing, like this Wilson line, will um, will create some effectively create some non locality. Like if you pass the stress, say the the current uh, corresponding to this gauge symmetry, the conserved current, mm -hmm. if you pass it under that Wilson line at the point. The point where it goes through, there'll be some singularity, and that point is actually exactly in this cross in this cross ratio variable z equals one. So you'll no longer have the discontinuity of s from one upwards vanishing. It'll actually get some, some extra contribution, the delta function proportional to uh, to the charge of the bulk field. And so the hope would be that you know this can be kind of characterized in some universal way. And so our thumb rules would now pick up some right-hand side. Yeah, I see. So, you, so you could sort of, I mean, yeah, ho we hope that this kind of thumb rule machinery would still be useful uh, if accounting for this right-hand side. What what are exactly these ANs? Like is something, you, is like specific for a given theory or is something universal? Well, you'd need to apply the thumb rule to this delta function. Yeah. So I guess, if it was really as simple as, as this right hand side as I've written here, a n would be, you know, you integrate this delta function uh, against hmm. uh, f n. So it would just be f n of one. Yeah, okay, I see. I see. Sounds but, good. Yeah, I guess, it's, I guess it's not clear how how universal this will be like one needs to see like if it depends on the choice of dressing or yeah uh, i wouldn't have a concrete statement but, but that's your expectation that it's something like this yeah okay sounds good other question okay there are no questions let's thank nat once again Thank you. Thank again. you very much. See you. Cheers.